my name is Brandon. I'm a member of Philly Socialists. It's a new group in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a sort of multi-tenancy socialist group that's focused on a lot of direct action. Can you talk to me a little bit about Occupy Philly? Yeah, well, I'm really happy to be here in Occupy Philly. Uh, Philly Socialists has a, you know, we, we voted to, to play a role in it. Um, and everyone I know pretty much is here from all different kinds of organizations I've been a part of or work with. Um, it's, it's, I think it's great that it's like the beginning of a dialogue and that it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a call to action. So, you know, whereas we didn't really have enough protests for years here, like almost never happened. We're having protests almost every day. We're starting them, we're, we're, we're talking about them in a committee meeting one night and two days later we're actually happening, having them. Uh, we're having a free exchange of ideas. It's like the kick that the left really needed so that it could be its own independent force. And people could think about what they want and there's obviously a lot of ideas on that. Uh, I'd like to stop you there. Um, so you would say this is a left-wing movement here in Occupy Philly? Well, it's definitely not a right-wing movement, and it's definitely not you know tied to the two main political parties, which have really dominated our whole political message. I mean, you watch the mainstream media, and their idea of figuring out the truth is to find two people that disagree, but they're both working for like a political party. Even you know they're not even like necessarily like you know. Well, you get right-wing ideologues that could never be elected, but you don't have real voices of the left in that. So people have been so tied up in our electoral system in this country that it's represented the whole debate. And so I think, yeah, the voices of the left are finally getting heard here. I mean, I don't think it's it's left in an inclusive way because our demands are things that, you know, everyone should be able to get behind, like stop the corporate crime, stop Wall Street from controlling our lives. But, I mean, I have to say, I don't think those are right-wing ideas, and I don't think that they're necessarily like mainstream centrist ideas in terms of our political process, because neither political party can you know, can fix any of these things, you know. Using the term left, I'm describing the sort of historical social forces that this seems to align with, and, you know, workers' rights, environmentalism, things like that, you know, that's what, that's what, like, you know, generally constitutes a broad left in this country and the world that has historically, I believe. Well, here, let me tell you where I'm coming from. I'm a libertarian myself. So when it comes to uh, stopping the corporations from controlling the economy, I agree with you. But the point of view uh, that a libertarian would have is that we need a free market free of government control that the government will always be controlled by the elites and the corporations and so if you advocate regulation and more powerful government thinking it'll stop corporations it will backfire on you well I just have to say as a socialist I'm not even advocating regulation that would be a nice first step but I think that our whole economic system is unjust I believe that it's not you know that the people who create the wealth don't receive any of it the people who get most of the wealth don't even do anything productive. And, you know, as to what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, and I've had this debate many times, but personally I believe that capitalism is working exactly the way it was intended to. Uh, this is what a free market is, and it's been this way for 200 years. And I think when people say that there's this other version of capitalism that just hasn't come out yet, you know, and it's based on this, like these ideological principles that go back to Adam Smith. I think that's kind of a fantasy because, you know, we've seen capitalism develop in the way that I think historically it's inclined to develop, where, you know, richer people consolidate more and more power. Uh, you know, different sections of, of, of capital merge and have more control over our economy and our lives and our political system. So if you guys have, you know, like a real working plan for how to how that would work, but I don't see, I don't understand this this idea that if you just stopped having regulation, everything would work itself out because that's the same thing that, that the, the people like Bush say. How you doing? Uh, my name's Rich. I'm a registered nurse here in Philadelphia. Uh, my, my sign today is uh, the flag hanging on a cross. Thanks, free trade, because I blame America's troubles on our failed trade policies. Uh, in America today, we are losing our police departments, our fire departments, we're losing education, Medicare and Medicaid, because good paying jobs have gone overseas. The American worker cannot compete with Chinese labor that earns $300 a month. The American worker cannot compete with Vietnamese labor that earns $60 a month. Nor we can compete with Mexican labor that earns $48 a week. We have to put up protectionist barriers like every other country that we trade with does. We cannot let low-wage made goods into America and let that put American workers out of out of a job. When we we cannot compete with low-wage labor around the world. Uh, well, you said you're a nurse. Right. So when it comes to health care, um, what do you say to the people that um, argue that the government is already heavily involved in health care? They're the ones who have ruined it. And what we really need is a free market in health care. 
Uh, I, I totally don't agree with that at all. I, as a bedside nurse, I'm not in management, I'm not in administration, I am at the bedside. I see too little government involvement in healthcare. We have an organization called JACO. JACO is a collection of hospital CEOs. Hospital CEOs are JACO, and they write the rules. It is self-inspection, and self-inspection, we saw what self-inspection did to Wall Street. They have robbed and raped the country. The CEOs are JACO, and JACO writes the rules for hospitals. The government actually has very little involvement in American health care. The CEOs write the rules and the laws for health care in America. And let me tell you something, JACO does what's profitable for the hospitals. Um, you wouldn't say that health care is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the United States? I believe that is an illusion. JACO is the governing body of health care in America. All rules and regulations must come through JACO. And what JACO is, is the hospital CEOs. It is, their, it is a private company. And JACO are the rules and regulations that me as a regular registered nurse and all the doctors work under. The rules are written to keep the hospital industry profitable. It is not the government like people think it is. It is part of the propaganda that is fed to the people in America. Okay. Uh, you don't know that, do you? You well, weren't I'm aware a, of that. I'm actually a libertarian, so I, I, just, I take a different point of view. Um, what about state medical boards? What about uh, things like that? I mean, if I wanted to open a, a doctor's practice tomorrow, me, who's not a physician, I, I would be shut down by the government. So how does that, that's not a free market. Well, you know, you have to look at, um, take a look at the AMA. You look at the top 10 corporate contributors in America at any given time. The AMA competes with the AHA, which is the American Hospital Association. They compete fourth and fifth. The way it works in the state of Pennsylvania and many other states across the country is that doctors groups and hospitals donate money to governor's campaigns. And then those hospital groups and those physician groups get to a point who sits on those governing bodies. So if you're a physician and you want to open up a practice, it's not necessarily the government, it's your own organization setting the rules and regulations that you're going to work under. It is propaganda fed to you. But aren't they, it's, you just said it's about con contributions to the government. It's through the government well, the that they politicians, do this. The politicians run it. That's why we have to get corporate money out of government. We have to end Citizens United. Citizens United will only allow more of this to happen. Citizens United. The decision. Citizens yeah, I'm United. Aware of it. Uh, they, they ruled that um, that was a matter of the power of government. The government doesn't have the power to shut down uh, free speech. I don't know about it. Citizens that's what, United. That's what Citizens United was ruled on. What Citizens United has resulted in is corporate money counting as speech, and corporate money should not be speech. Corporations are not people. Listen, I respect the libertarian point of view, but right now the corporations are very, very powerful, and they are licking their chops. They, the corporations, want government out of the way so they can start to step in and rule. Uh, well, how about uh, the idea that the corporations and the government work together? Well, the Holy Trinity, the Holy Trinity is the worker, the government, and the corporation. That's what we had in America while times were good. Now, the worker's been marginalized, and what we have is government and the corporation. Instead of destroying government, something that I have a say in, let's put the worker back in the picture. picture. Let's put the Holy Trinity back together. Let's put the worker back in the picture. Maybe we can end on a note we agree on. You want to get, you want to end uh, corporate personhood? Absolutely. Well, we agree on something. All right, brother. <laughs> Do you know about that magnificent episode in human history, the Paris Commune? Well, well, the story starts with uh, stupidity. I am speaking of Napoleon the Third, the nephew of Bonaparte. He was a buffoon, a stage actor smiling to the crowd while 16 million French peasants lived in blind, dark hovels, their children dying of starvation. But because he kept the legislature, because the people voted, they thought they had a democracy. A very common mistake. Yes. And well, Bonaparte wanted glory. So he made the mistake of attacking Bismarck's armies. He was quickly defeated, whereupon the Victorian German, victorious German troops marched into Paris and were greeted by something more devastating than guns. 
silence. They found the statues of Paris draped in black, this immense, invisible, silent resistance. So the Germans did the wise thing. They paraded through the Arc de Triomphe and quickly departed. And the old French order, the Republic, liberals they called themselves, they did not dare enter Paris. They were trembling with fear because now, with the Germans gone, Paris was taken over by the workers. The housewives, the clerks, the intellectuals, the students, the armed citizens, and the people of Paris formed not a government, but something more glorious, something governments everywhere fear, a commune, the collective energy of the people. It was the commune de Paris. People meeting 24 hours a day all over the city in knots of three and four, making decisions together while the city was encircled by the French army, threatening to invade at any moment. Paris became the first free city of the world. The first enclave of liberty in a world of tyranny. And I said to Bakunin, do you want to know what I mean by the dictatorship of the proletariat? Look at the commune of Paris and your politicians are bloated with pride. The world will hold to the free enterprise system, they say. Has everyone become stupid? Don't they know the history of the free enterprise system when governments did nothing for the people and everything for the rich? When your government gave 100 million acres of land free to the railroads but looked away as Chinese immigrants and Irish immigrants worked 12 hours a day on those railroads and they were dying in the heat and dying in the cold and when the workers finally rebelled and went on strike, your government sent armies to smash them into submission. Why the hell did I write Das Kapital if not because I saw the misery of capitalism? That is true democracy, not the democracy of England or America where elections are circuses with people voting for one or another guardian of the old order where whatever candidate wins, the rich will go on ruling you and your country. If my wife Jenny were here, she'd know what to say about all this. In 1943, I wrote that in this new industrial system, capitalism, that people are estranged from their work because it is distasteful to them. I wrote that people are alienated from nature as machines, smoke, smells, noise invade their senses. Progress, it is called. And I wrote that people are alienated from each other because under capitalism, everyone is set against everyone else, scrambling for survival. And I wrote that people are alienated from their own true selves, living lives that are not their own, living as they do not really want to live so that a good life is possible only in dreams and fantasies. But it does not have to be this way. You uh, resent my coming back and irritating you? No. Well, well, look at it this way. It is the second coming. Christ couldn't make it. So Marx came. Hi, I'm Karen Jacobs. I'm from southern New Jersey, and I'm here to educate people on the Federal Reserve. Um, I feel that a lot of people don't understand where our money comes from and how it's created and how it's distributed and also how, uh, you know, the banks uh, loan out money and we get the bill. So I'm just here to hand out some information and uh, answer anybody's questions that they make. A lot of good information here on some videos um, for those people who don't like to read long articles and uh, okay. okay so how do you think uh, how do you think Ron Paul's message is relevant to the Occupy movement? I think Ron Paul's message is relevant as he has always been an advocate for limited government, smaller government, um, and trying to audit the Federal Reserve and uh, bring their criminal activity, you know. To public life. What does that mean? It's a Hebrew saying that means to repair the world. It's something that's taught in our theology and our culture that it's our responsibility to, to uh, be stewardships of this planet in whatever capacity we need to be. Yeah, yeah, I would like to. Hey, V. Oh. Actually, I 
section. She get beat. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations again. 